<laughs> and we're live! <laughs> Finally! This is LinuxInstall.net, episode number 92. I'm your host, Brian Wagner. With me, as always, are my faithful co-hosts, Mr. Joseph Luzzi. Brian. Greg. Hey, Mr. Greg Martin. How are you doing this afternoon, or this evening? Af- close. <laughs> well, uh, we should we should preface that LinuxInstall.net is now brought to you with more cat sex. Uh, <laughs> Someday we'll figure out how to do these broadcasts where everybody can see what we're talking about before the episode starts, so it makes a whole lot more sense. No, 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 do not. We don't, we don't want them to know. It, Conceal it, it, the you know, mystery. You... Conceal the mystery. Anyways. I'm doing peachy, Brian. Are you? Now that, I'm not at, now that I'm not at Macy's anymore, I feel great. Where are you at now? Yeah, this I'm, is new. <laughs> I, I'm actually at my desk again for the second time in a row. Uh, usually I'm on my laptop in a bunker. With all white walls, mind you. Um, I see. But now we've moved the trash can and everything's normal again. Yes. So, what's been up with you this week, Greg? Um... Nothing really. I just Android coding for for work and uh, trying to get back into C plus plus programming with a little project. And I wrote a wrote a little telltale story on my on my blog about starting out with a, a library called SFML and uh, trying to get it to work on Fedora, which was painful to say the least. All right, for everybody, uh, including me, what is SFML? SFML stands for Simple and Fast Multimedia Library. Um, basically, it is a audio, video, networking, and stateful management library for C++ programs. Uh, in other words, you can write games with it. It's its primary goal, uh, but you can inject it into other programs and use, you know, like the networking facilities or the audio facilities or something like that. You don't necessarily have to make a game with it. Um, But in my particular case, I am actually going to try to make a little bit of a game with it. Um, I've had an idea for a game kicking around for a while, and I haven't... I've got everything written down, but I just haven't decided which way I wanted to go with it, and I figured, well, you know, C++ is my warm and fuzzy language. I'll write with that. And SFML looks pretty solid. I've never used it before, but it looks good. Uh, and the only thing I'm going to say about the game is it has a character named Placenta Chicken. And that's it. Okay. <laughs> there you Next. go, Joe. How are you doing, Joe? Uh, yeah, I guess okay. I'm not too sure how I can model <laughs> that up. You, you, you could have gone, Brian, next. You didn't have to go to me. <laughs> Um, no, I, I really I like sharing. Go ahead. Yeah, gee, gee, so gee, far, gee. so far, we've got cat sex and placenta chicken. Gee, <laughs> gee thanks. Uh, okay, yeah, I've just been, I guess, working with computers. Um, <laughs> no, a, um, no, it's one of the. It's funny. One of the stories we have today is um, about samba, and one of the things I was actually working on a couple of days ago was actually setting up a samba server. Um, that a DOS box was going to connect to. Yes, DOS. You made, I think we, you made mention, I think we mentioned that, this before. Yeah, in yeah. the last podcast. Yeah, so I actually built the server, had the Samba share up and running and everything, but then they actually had the DOS share actually working with Windows, so I basically got to trash my server after working on it for a little bit. <laughs> so it was, it was fun while I got to play with it for a little bit. Um, other than that, just building some servers, waiting for the PlayStation 4 to come out, Extremely yes. bummed. Extremely bummed that uh, Watch Dogs was delayed um, because that was the bundle I have ordered from Amazon. So is the bundle delayed? The bundle's not going to be delayed. It sounds like they're still going to get everybody the system that pre-ordered it, and you just won't have the game until it comes out. But the oh. game sounds like it was delayed about seven to nine months. Holy shit! Yeah, buddy. Whoa! So, well, it's being put out by Ubisoft and. They're also releasing Assassin's Creed 4 as a launch title, so they probably don't want to compete with themselves. So they're just pushing it off. So 
that's my guess as to why they're doing it. I mean, they basically waited until the eleventh hour to postpone it. So, well, yeah, and I then mean, it, that much too. I mean, what the hell? Yeah, and then I was reading online today. There's another rumor going around that another launch title, Drive Club, might be might be um, delayed. And those are the two games I really wanted to play on the PlayStation Four when I got it on launch day. So, <laughs> did the did the PS3? I can't remember. Did the PS3 have the same launch title issues? Or some well, of them just. Oh, damn it. It says we're back on air again. Oh, okay. We are back on air. I'm reading my phone. Hello, everybody. <laughs> How are you today? I don't even know where we dropped off because that was in the middle of my PlayStation 4 story. But you can go to hell now, Brian. Because you don't have a good computer. Brian. I don't know what happened. I kind of think we need to start this over again. Sorry. Just run with it, dude. Just run with it. Just let's. Uh, yeah, well, we're back I don't on know if air. We're recording. It says it's on air. Hang on. Let me go back. Let me go back to the stream. Hang on a second. See if it's on. I pulled something up and it flipping went nuts. Why are you touching things while we're recording? I clicked a link, dude. We've done how many podcasts? Ninety-two. Ninety-two. Uh, yeah, the stream's back online, actually. It picked up right where so, I left off. <laughs> so I this was is going to be about, fun to edit. All right. <laughs> I was talking about the PlayStation 4. A couple of games are delayed. Go on, move. Brian, how's your week? How's my week? Um, it was doing fine until about, I don't know, five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> and I have no idea what I clicked on, but I, I'm not clicking on anything else. Somebody else will have to be in charge of the Brian stories. Brian broke Porn. <laughs> porn. It wasn't uh, porn. I, I fessed up to porn. It wasn't porn. Hey, Brian, did, did you see um, Leo's uh, on Twitter, who Leo had on there for triangulation? 
I made yesterday. Did see it? I have not watched it yet, but I did. I see have it. not watched it either, and I wanted to watch it too. I don't know if you've seen this, Greg, but there's a new Kickstarter out there for this new um, virtual reality headset, kind of like eyeglasses, called Cast AR. And Leo was interviewing um, one of the ladies, I think, that's actually designing it. I think she's uh, she's the. According to the link I saw, it was both the two founders. Oh, it was both of them. Okay, I didn't realize it was both of them. This looks really cool, though. After the podcast, I will get you a link uh, so you can check this out, Greg. It was really sweet. Yeah, I, I want I Cast AR. Uh, I, I am still dead set against this VR shit. No, man. no, no! I, it I is really coming am. to you. It is coming to you, buddy. It's coming to you. I did see. So, I'm gonna be I in your neighborhood see. looking for you. All right, I or saw an Randy interview. Savage. <laughs> yeah, turn the Savage off. I saw an <laughs> interview with um, the Veronica Belmont did on Texilla. I watched the episode of Texilla where she oh, was I mean, interviewing. I that one. Uh, she interviewed Jerry Ellsworth, okay. who's one of the two founders of the company. She interviewed her, and they were talking about it. And basically, Ellsworth said. There is nothing stopping anybody from buying enough of the reflective material and enough of the infrared lights that you need. You know, you'd have to set it up right. But you could actually make almost a complete working holodeck minus the actual text. You know, it can't actually oh, yeah. generate stuff. But, like, actually being able to walk in and completely immerse yourself into an experience. See, and there was another article I saw yesterday where there's a lot of companies now investing in, like, and come and create trying to create like a Google Glass experience. Uh-huh. And right now I think we're just on the precipice of all this stuff coming forward and there's so many companies trying this. I'm really leery to go into any of them because they all look super cool, but one or two of them are going to have to come out and try to be probably like a standard or something I'm guessing. So <laughs> it's right now it's just probably such a such a hard time to invest in any of these because what if you pick the wrong one? It could, this could be like VHS and beta. Right. Well, and not only that, but the, the other thing that I was thinking about with it, I mean, it looks really cool, and I might, because it, it's not ridiculously expensive. Right, right. No, it's not. I agree with you. Um, I mean, because you can get it with a wand for less than $300. Right. So it's not, it's not prohibitively expensive, which I think is one of her goals. Um, and this is first generation, so second generation will probably be still cheaper and even better. Um... I agree with you on the the thing. It's it is could easily be a beta versus VHS issue. They need something, some sort of standard though. That's the thing that's missing from all of them. They don't mm-hmm. have a standard that they can write code to that they can make their glasses interact with. You know, something right. like an Android OS type, but for these glasses that developers would be able to write to take advantage of the glasses. Um, just like developers, game developers writing to take advantage of special features in video cards, which they used to do, which I haven't heard of anybody doing in a long time. They still do. Do they? Yeah. Tomb Ra- the new Tomb Raider game took advantage of, like, Tress FX, which is an AMD-specific technology. Mm-hmm. For hair. That's the thing that... Yeah, that's the thing that makes the hair models, like, extraordinarily realistic. Yeah. Uh, but you have to have a specific version of, like, the Radeon cards, and they usually have to be running in SLI. Or not SLI, uh, Crossfire. <laughs> yeah, and I Sorry, think a lot work. of those. I think a lot of that stuff is real. They, there, there isn't a lot of that stuff. I mean, like the way you used to have the old drivers back in the day that used to use Glide and everything. <sighs> I mean, yeah. I mean, they uh, the the industry got away from that with the advent of like DirectX really taking off and OpenGL. They went more towards those, and DirectX has pretty much been more of the dominant one. I think. Um, Unfortunately, but I but unfortunately, but I think there there are some cases where we're going to be going back to things like the Tress FX and some other things. I think coming in the next year or two for some of these newer video technologies. So we're really off base here on Linux. <laughs> so no, but, Brian, but at the same time here? we aren't though because <laughs> Valve is coming on Linux and, and you know that's that's right, a right. big thing. So this really isn't that far. Yeah, and their okay, problem. I'm, I'm clutching at I'm clutching at straws, but you know. Right. Well, uh, I mean, their problem is the you know writing to gallium and all this other shit. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a pain in the ass. Uh, Joe was starting to ask me what I was doing this week. I uh, am 
learning how to do things. I'm still playing with uh, the Docker stuff, um, trying to learn how to, to manage that, trying to learn more about, and I'm going to write an article on this, the difference between a, a container and a VM. I tried to give an explanation last week. I'm not going to try it again. Um, it's, it's similar but different. It, it's really hard to explain what the differences are. They're pretty small. Um, give, it, give it a shot. I'm interested to hear, actually. So a VM basically emulates everything. It's a complete machine, hardware, software, everything. And when you make a VM, you make a complete image of the OS. It allows you to run Windows on Linux, um, Linux on Windows, that kind of stuff. Supposedly, you can do that with containers. I don't really understand how that would work. But containers allow you to create a base image of an OS and then run multiple things off of that container. So I can set it up, and it's more like just insulating it from whatever the core OS is. Or, But is it decoupled from the hardware component? No. It relies on whatever the base OS's hardware setup is, and it uses those drivers, and that that's where the container, like the, the version of the different container um, platforms come in, is how they abstract the hardware. But it's not all that abstracted, from what I'm reading. So hmm. I'm trying to I'm trying to fully form what the differences are, um, other than you don't really get a console on a on a container. So unlike a VM where you can go to the console all the time, you can't really get to the console of a container. And you can actually have a container just run one piece of software. So one of the things they talk about a lot with doing things in containers is you break your application down to its parts. So the database is one container. The application is one container. The web server is one container. You don't have to split them up that far, but that's the example that they give most of the time. So you can have each of those things. You start each of those things. They're all their own self-contained OS. So in theory, if somebody... The other thing is, too, is it's all natted. There is no direct connections from the Internet to that. You have to specifically allow connections to those containers at an OS level or a, whatever you're using for the container. Uh, the container software has to allow those connections in, um, which has its pluses and minuses, but mostly in the area of performance. Supposedly, that though, there are people making this very performant, and it can perform just as good as a virtual machine, so just as good as KVM or VMware. Um, or then it's um, it's an interesting concept. I like it because I can pick that container up and throw it on any OS, any underlying OS, and it doesn't matter. It'll still run like it's, you know, if I set up stuff on Ubuntu and I need, because the provider only provides CentOS, I can put the containers on CentOS and still run Ubuntu. And I don't have to reconfigure anything. I don't have to change anything. Because it's not going off, or it's not, you know, exposing ports, security is less of a concern for the container. You just have to secure the OS, and then all of your separate containers, in theory, don't have to be as secure because you're only allowing the ports that you're allowing to those. So you just have to secure the software. You don't have to secure the whole OS. Hmm. So it's, it's interesting. Um, and I'm, I'm, like I said, working on writing an, a story up about it to try to explain, not a story, but writing an article to explain the differences and what, I've, what I believe the best use for this technology is. Hmm. So I, have that's what, I want to catch that one. Yeah. And we'll probably have a better show describing it. Um, but Docker, if you haven't played with it, it's super simple to set up, super simple to use. Um, there's a bunch of examples on their, on the doc, doc .cloud um, website or the docker.io website. Um, it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, if you guys have heard of Heroku or 
Um, they now have a partnership with OpenShift, which is Red Hat's platform as a service. Uh, that's what this type of software would be used for. That's what containers would be used for as a platform as a service type thing. So they even have, there's a demo out there, if you look around for it, of how to set up Docker to be your own platform as a service. So you can provide that. It's pretty rudimentary. You'd have to do a whole bunch of more work, but it's got the basics there. So hmm. it's neat stuff. For some Sounds of the other stuff I'm doing, it's... It might work for some other projects that I'm working on. Yeah, I'm interested, but it's not it's not immediately within my ballpark of expertise. Um, let's see what else. That's that's pretty much it. That's been actually kind of time consuming. That and I'm uh, playing around with the developer tools to see what you can actually do on a Squarespace site if you actually use the developer site, the, the developer tools that they are now providing, which gets me a full Git repository of all the templates and stuff like that. So you can, oh, cool. you can merge all that stuff in. So I'm trying to see what else I can do with it, see if I can. What is that? What are those templates written in? Uh, the templates are all HTML and CSS, and they have their own... You put in tags, it looks just like any other tags I've seen. I mean, it, the tags look very similar to PHP or Django's. Um, their templates, it, it's just a templating language, more or less, uh, but it gives you the ability to write more complex stuff easier if you do the developer stuff. So if you want to do something really complex on the Squarespace site, you can do it, you just have to do it via get, which means you lose the uh, you lose the ability to uh, use a lot of their features. But you I have more CSS control and more JavaScript control, so I will have to play around with that. You can get a free account if anybody wants to try it out. You can get a free account. The free accounts for developers, because development takes longer than two weeks generally, or to see if something's going to work, they will actually there is no limit, unlike the two-week trial for uh, just a normal website. If you're doing a developer site, there is no limit to it. You just start paying as soon as you have the site that's ready to go live. You have a, a yeah. next screen before you're ready to go live. So. You, you heard it here first, people. Brian doesn't want me playing around with the Linux install.net site. He wants <laughs> me to play around with somebody else's site first and then come back. Well, this isn't for Linux. I'm not doing this to the Linux install.net site. That's the that is one of my hangups with this. I can't have a site that is both the normal Squarespace site and a developer site. What? Yeah, I can't get access to all the templates and stuff through Git for the Linux install.net site because I set that up as a traditional site with them. I can um. only access a new site that I set up. That's crap. Yes, yes it is. <laughs> but well, it's probably so, it. It could be something that they're possibly working on to give access to, to where you'll be able to maybe flip back and forth. There could be some difficulties in doing that, though. I suspect right now it's a licensing issue because those so. templates aren't aren't all created by them, so it may just be licensing. Because there's no template to the stuff that I have I, on the developer site. When I look at the site, it's a pretty crappy looking site right now because <laughs> I haven't done anything to make it look better. I'm going over there now. Okay, wait until after the show. We've already had enough issues with people clicking on things. <laughs> Hang on, I'm going to go there too. Let's see what I can do. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Bottleneck. What I was trying oh, to God. Do. Oh, God. Where did I go? What did I click on? Who am I? Cat sex. <laughs> Yeah. Anyways, on, jo on Joe's this computer, is, this is the most <laughs> screwed up we've ever been on any episode. <laughs> <laughs> That's saying I a was lot. actually, I was actually going to um, start up a Squarespace site here, maybe this weekend, and actually you start using my domain because uh, I haven't created a. I was just going to do a blog with it, but I was actually going to use Squarespace for it. The eight dollars site. I mean, you get all the tools and features for eight bucks a month. Yeah. So it's, I highly recommend it. I know a lot of people like to do WordPress, but WordPress is a lot of work, especially to keep it secure so that people can't easily hack your site. And Squarespace just takes care of that stuff. 
Yeah, and that's why I was just going to go with them. So, so, should we get on with our first story? Let's get on with our first story. <clears throat> and that would be Samba 4.1's released. It now supports Windows 8 and 2012 server. Woohoo! Yay! Like I said earlier, I was playing around with, I was playing around with Samba this week. Yes, but you weren't trying to support newer OSs, Joe. You're trying to support no, really old OSs. That's right. <laughs> OS 2 Warp. That's right. No, he's gone even before Warp. He's pre-Warp, yeah. baby. Yeah, this would this oh, that's been probably pre-Warp. Really? Okay, yeah, see, there's, there's my young age coming out. Yeah, yeah there well, were OSs before Warp, just so you know. Yeah. And why didn't... What version of DOS was out when OS2 Warp came out? Because that would have been... OS2 Warp was probably around 91, maybe? 90, 92? 91, something like that? So it had to be yeah, like 90, DOS. Yeah, 90, 91. Right around but the time it would have been, been in college. Later DOSes, yeah. Because so. I remember a friend of mine showing me that he could do all kinds of stuff, reboot things in the back, like reboot the OS while he's still working in his word processor. It was really strange. Yeah, that no is... OS has, no OS has done it since. It's really... Yes. OS Warp did a whole bunch of stuff that nothing else has even come close to doing. Um, but, anyways. So, uh, I think most of us read the article. It can actually be brought... You can actually bring in the Samba server as an AD domain member. Mm-hmm. The main controller, I'm sorry. Which is pretty sweet. So you can only you only have to have one nine hundred dollar a year bill. You can actually then put a whole bunch of Linux servers up and do all your file shares off of the Linux boxes, which will probably get you better performance anyways. Um, but they were actually focusing a lot on the ability of Linux and Macs being able to use Samba to connect to 2008 and 2012 servers. Right. And I never knew that was a problem. <laughs> so, obviously, I haven't tried connecting to my Windows 8 laptop to see if I can do that. I haven't really needed to. Yeah, you know, it's, I was just going to say the same thing. <laughs> um, it's, it sounds great. So now I can can do all this stuff. I can connect to that. Uh, the only thing it sounds like they deprecated SWAT, which was the yeah I know GUI, the GUI tool for SWAT Samba. Was, SWAT was how I configured Samba. Mm-hmm. Now you just got to do it through the SMB comp file, which is how I actually did it the other day. Did you? Wow, yes. I'm impressed. That was fun. <laughs> it was interesting. I don't really understand why they don't come out with another management tool if they're going to deprecate SWAT. It really, it really wasn't that hard. I mean, you're going in there, you're defining, you know, once you come up with your names and you basically just come up with what your share and your mount is and everything like that, it was actually pretty straightforward. Just going in and editing the smb.com file, so. Well, yeah, but you're not setting up printers and... No, correct. It was, I was just doing one share, so it was very easy. <laughs> That's why I didn't have to worry about too, too much stuff. I got off rather easy when I had to do it. But that was the only time I really used SWAT, was trying to get printers to work is not difficult, but you got to make sure the right driver loads. And right. If you're doing, if you're going to be doing a lot of shares, like unlike me who was just doing the one share, I mean, I could see where you'd want something that was a little bit easier than just going in and trying to create by hand all of the different pieces of the SMB comp file, so. And I think if I was going to do something where I was going to need a lot of shares, I would probably go with something like FreeNAS mm-hmm. with, that, that already has Samba built in that, right. that could help you manage those shares a little more efficiently. But is there an alternative to SWAT, though? Uh, there's a bunch of, I don't know if there's, SWAT was the one supported by them, so I don't know. SWAT was showing its age. I mean, it was a pretty ugly web interface. <laughs> <laughs> it was not Web 2.0 by any. It was like Web 0.5. I mean, it was it was pretty bad. Um, but it was functional and it did what you needed it to do. 
I I know you can control it. There's other ways to do it. You can control it with Webmin. You can control it with most of the control panels that are out there. Have plugins to manage Samba shares because it's so common a thing to do. It's not it's not that hard to find an alternative to SWAT to do it. So I, I don't think it's a huge loss. I'm just you know I'm sad to see it go. Now I have to install something else to manage it. But anymore, I've been installing Webmin to manage my Linux boxes for all the niddly stuff that I need to do. Yeah, and it seems like the main reason they got rid of this they got rid of SWAT because it was just too hard to secure. Mm-hmm. So yeah, wasn't that how it goes with any legacy software though? I mean, like I shouldn't say any legacy software, but most software were more components of it get updated than others, and then you come back to it and just realize, yeah, that kind of doesn't work anymore. Well, I, yeah, I think there's that, and I think it's also the... Um, anytime you're dealing with management software, something that's going to try to manage the server, it, it's just inherently insecure because you have to give it so many privileges to do its job that, you know, it's it, does, it only takes one oops for a programmer, and wow, now everybody can do everything. So, yeah, it was difficult. I'm sure it was difficult to secure. I always just bound it to 127.0.0.1, and then you have to be on the box to be able to get to it. So, right, home, home, baby. Yep. So, you know, and if you know how to use SSH, that's not a problem even on a remote server. So, it's all good. All right, next but story. Let's keep move keep it moving. Keep it moving. We have a lot of stories tonight, so. Yet another Java hole. Actually, 51 of them uh, were set, fixed recently. Who set up the order to these? Because the order they were on the list is not how we're talking about them. Okay. All right. I'm on the right one now. It's the ones on the list. Everybody will see like in the show I, notes. It's the I, one on the list because I made I, the list. I just now saw that thing in the introduction. Greg is not at Macy's. Yes. <laughs> I'm not there. It's a, it's the truth. Did you skip the server, the monitoring survey? No, I ordered it differently. I didn't did I see. Obviously, I must have. Oh, see, see, Joe can't keep track of a, a simple list. Well, of you're move, you're moving things during the middle. We of the talked podcast. about that. I didn't. I moved them before the podcast. Anyway, I was probably stop taking the dogs out. Stop. Probably. Anyways, we come to your neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard that before. <laughs> I've heard that before. Anyways, the October critical patch update for Oracle came out for Java. Uh, it was released on the 15th. There was a staggering, according to this article, 127 security vulnerabilities that were fixed, including 51 of them that are specific to Java. So I don't really understand what the other other ones were. Well, those those patch updates apply to you know Oracle's broad array of shit products. Yes. So, oh, I see. so it's it's yeah, yeah. Uh, Brian, I thought you said you read the article. I did. Because it actually explained it in the article. Oh well shut up. <laughs> anyways, I did, but that was like hours ago at this point. So anyway it, it, it all belongs to their October what they're calling their CPU, which yes. is their patch which is their whole patch piece. And because it includes Larry not only has to try to co op Every acronym, but anyways, yes. From from the yacht. Yeah, from the yacht. Um, anyways, so yeah, big surprise. Still yet more bugs inside of Java. Yeah, I'd like to see. I I, I have to dig. I've I've had a pretty good run so far of digging up some of these vulnerabilities, like actual source code showing the exploit, and getting it to run. And I'd be interested to see if I could find some of these. Um, they, most of the, most of the exploits actually come from the uh, reflection API, which is really interesting. And for those that don't know, reflection API is a lot of the language to basically report on itself. So it, it's really like they they combine the use of reflection with Java beams, which are shit anyways. So don't use them; they're bad. I've heard that before. No, they are seriously. <laughs> Why do you think they're not in Android? Yes. So, a bunch of fixes out there. If you have Java installed and need it for a critical system, you probably want to patch it. I wonder if this applies to OpenJDK. 
Because uh, because the Oracle JDK is compiled differently. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. That's either the other on that thing one. too, because well, and there's that, and then there's also the always outstanding question too of so this is Oracle's implementation of Java. IBM wrote Java, rewrote Java from the ground up. Total Greenfield implemented their own versions of memory uh, management things like garbage collection and enhanced and added additional ways you could run garbage collection to make it work better with their suite of software. I mean, practically everything IBM does anymore is written in Java. So um, I would imagine that there there's a possibility that they're there. But who knows? I mean, people might have just fixed these. Oh, this is a bug. It, you know, it depends on how glaring the bug was when they looked at the code. You know, somebody looking at it on the Open JDK project might have looked at it and said, "Well, that's a security hole. Let me fix that." And so, you're, you know, and they wouldn't necessarily have raised a red flag. I mean, they probably should have, but they wouldn't have necessarily done that. And IBM may have just fixed it because they rewrote everything from scratch. Because, like you said, it's it's the whole beans thing. And right. I don't. I don't know. Oh, it's Beans, and then, you know, the legacy applet API, and then I actually think there's some problems with JavaFX. Um, but this is why I'd like to get the exploit code, is because, you know, I'd like to see, you know, can I hit OpenGDK with this stuff? Can I hit IBM's implementation with this stuff? Um, you know, the, a lot of times when you see these reports about Java exploits, they're really only targeting Oracle's implementation, not the 13 other ones that are out there. Right, and I think one of the other things they're trying to say in the article is Oracle only does a quarterly patch update. So they're saying, right. considering how much they're actually patching, they probably need to switch to monthly like a lot of the other companies do. Because that's kind of ridiculous that you're releasing this much at one time right, in one quarter and yeah. that these vulnerabilities are sitting out there that long. Well, yeah. It'd be better to, yeah, I mean, sorry, Brian. I mean, it'd be better, too, for, if they did that because if they do this bulk patching like that, and then it breaks some, you know, some functionality that a business uses. Mm -hmm. exactly. you know, they can't, they, they can't run with the update because the entire patch is going to break it. So they're going to be stuck with those vulnerabilities until they're not broken. Right. You know, it's the the common th you know, the, the the thing is with developers, you fix one bug, you've got nine hundred and ninety eight more to fix, and Correct. that applies here. <laughs> Yes. But in this particular situation, with, with there being so many that they're fixing, and you kind of have to try it at least. And I've I've been supporting, at least for web apps, I've been supporting web apps for years. And it's really rare anymore that a bug fix breaks. And I say that I'm sure this, well, there's 51 of them, so there's 51 <laughs> chances. But... <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, see, it, it won't break the web apps, but I can tell you from experience there are, you know, enterprise desktop Java apps that will literally explode oh, in definitely. your face if you update Java. I mean, they will just puke to death. Your whole enterprise deployment will be screwed. I, 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 know, I know several places I've worked over the years that have had Java apps that you're stuck with an older version of Java because the app that you need to do X particular piece of your job only runs on that version of Java. So and if you only, jump up to a later one, it's if you if you patch it to a later one, you're screwed. Right, and the only way to fix that is to recompile the binary with the new version of the API and then redeploy it. Right. Or and, and nobody does probably, that. Well, this is probably more of the problem, which is that companies are running the same versions of the software on top of Java that they were running when Java came out. <laughs> right? This was they, they with have one it. too. <laughs> right. I don't. You're laughing, man. I've no, no. Trust me. Environments no. where it's like, holy smokes, how does this keep running? Matter of fact, I have to patch a server. I mean, I have to migrate a server on Sunday. That that literally was the comment. Wow, I can't believe that. POS is still, the, the equipment <laughs> is still functional. It's that old. You know, and I'm like, well, it, it sits in a relatively clean environment. It's not in the middle of the 
the dirty part of the shop, you know, it's in a clean part of the shop. So, yeah. Right. I mean, Oh no! I I mean there there so, are some IBM Java libraries that I've that I've used before and and IBM's really really you know really finicky about releasing their their libraries for some of their products and um, one of their libraries in particular was compiled with the one three version of Java still being used to this day and it's the only one they have. Wow! Yeah, it's amazing. So. All right, enough harshing on the uh, the Java craze. Shall we move on to the next story? Sure. Joe's about Susie. Yeah. Susie Joe. So saw this today, and since I happen to use um, Slez at work, um, I thought this was rather interesting. Um, Open Susie, they are moving. Yes, they are moving from the YCP, which we all looked up right before this. YCP is a scripting language um, which is used basically for YAST. Um, that's all we'll say about that. And they're moving it to Ruby. Why are they doing this? Because nobody does YCP anymore. All the developers, it sounds like, who are doing YCP have moved on to other things. So they want to try to find something that's a little more current and standard, and they decided on Ruby. Um, so it sounds like you probably won't notice any difference in YAST um, if you are using um, a SUSE product as they try to really define and tune the product so that there won't be any difference um, between the two versions. Um, that's about it. I mean, so I'm guessing we're probably, truthfully, none of us should probably notice a difference, I guess, is what, it, is what it's basically coming down to. I'm a scripter who spent a lot of time scripting stuff in on SLES. Mm-hmm. I, and you probably never used YCP. I didn't even know what YCP was, so <laughs> <They're> I, <with. laughs> pretty sure I'm not going to miss it. Um, <laughs> but the other thing is, too, is I don't know a lot of companies that are sp- using any of the, especially in Linux, any of the uh, specific language, you know, mach- or OS, or I got not not OS, but distribution specific code anymore. Everybody's moving to stuff like Salt or Puppet, which we'll talk about here in a minute, or um, some other distributed management tool, Fabric, something, where you know you can write it once and run it on any of your Linuxes instead of having to write one version for YCP, obviously, one version for something specific to Red Hat. Right. So... Uh, Good on them for changing to Ruby. At least you know it'll be a more more, mota- more maintainable code base. You can the- probably get probably get some more developers possibly in, interested in um, contributing then. Yeah. Since it's since it's going to be on a language that you know, like I said, more people are using right now. Correct. So, so that's mm-hmm. that's actually probably good for Yast because um, Yast is actually a really good tool with 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 Slez. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've always really liked um, liked Yast um, with, for with Suzy. I think it's a really, really good um, component for that for that distribution. And Susie's always been known as the admins distribution. It's the one that most admins always liked. Um, it had a stronghold on servers for the longest time. It's kind of lost some of that to well, it's number two to Red Hat, but right. It it had a, a, the reason why it maintains that number two status is because it still has a lot of people who still like all the functionality that you get out of. Um, out of the the YAST tools, basically, and and the other stuff that Suzy just builds in. The way they do things by default is, in my opinion, a little bit better than what Red Hat does. It, it does it doesn't try to do so many things by default that it makes it hard to use. Having used Red Hat a lot at work lately, I would have to agree with you on that. I would have to agree with you 100% on that statement. And I, I mean, have a feeling there's other admins I work with that will agree with me 100% on that statement. I don't agree with you. <laughs> um, I, yeah. So, good on them. Glad to hear it. Glad they're moving to something a little more modern. Hopefully, Susie will follow suit um, because this is just open Susie. So, hopefully, the corporate right. version will do that. I also, I don't know if you guys saw this, but uh, I believe Amazon has a free tier where you can actually use SUSE now. The oh, I didn't see sleds. that. Mm-hmm. So you can, do a, you can do the developer version 
the free tier of the Amazon stuff with with a SUSE image for free with no charge. Oh, there. Good job. So, anyways, hey Joe, why don't you tell us about Puppet while I figure out what that is? Puppet. Well, a puppet is a, is a little a little doll that has strings like the marionette. No, puppet is software, and we are actually using it at work. Um, new version is coming out. Three point one was available this week. Um, I actually sat in on a webinar for I think it was three point one. I think it was three point one. I'm pretty sure it was because that's the latest one. Um, a lot of the things that they were adding into this newest version um, probably aren't going to be things, though, that I hate to say we probably won't use. Um, a lot of the stuff does look really slick um, with the level of with the level that it gives you to get down to look into some of your applications and trace some things through. We're not really using it for that. We're using it more just to keep a lot of the software components um, on the same level and keep particular... Um, RPMs and everything at the same level and different packages and pieces. Um, <laughs> this is just the most interesting episode ever. Oh my so, god. This is great. Um, <laughs> it's not, it sounds like the new version is going to give you a lot, a lot more cues into helping you troubleshoot your system and everything. But like I said... We have monitoring software where I work, um, which does a lot of this stuff for us. A lot of the stuff that they were introducing with Puppet seemed like it was overlapping. Um, so like I said, some of the newer features, we aren't jumping to the newest version as of right now. We talked about it as a team. Um, we're kind of going to hold off for a little bit before we jump to this one. Um, everything that the version we're running right now, which I think is version 3, Puppet's doing great for us. I mean, when I build a server, I basically get it um, authenticated to my Puppet server, and bam, within like a minute or two, it's blowing down RPMs, and it's basically bringing up packages, and it's making all my servers look like one standard um, build, which is outstanding. It is a huge time saver um, in, in the realm of building servers. I will say that. I mean, one of the best tools I've used um, since becoming a Linux admin, I will say. Yeah, I looked at this, and this is another step. Puppet's been doing this for a little while. They've been kind of dabbling in system monitoring, which is right, what you're yeah. saying. It's it's like a the current the current version that started to do this. This three one version definitely makes that step towards that. Um, I don't know. I've never seen anybody do a monitoring and management tool in one that worked really well. Yeah, it's usually one or the other because you're you, you're usually going to have to sacrifice something in one to be able to do both. So right. So I don't know. One of the things that I thought was interesting on this, you guys aren't using it to manage any Windows servers, right? The Windows team is using a different tool. I think the Windows team is using a different tool, but recently there have been some Windows servers that have fallen into the realm of the team I work on, and I believe we were going to put a puppet agent on there so we so we can standardize some stuff on okay. them. Um, I don't know if we've done that yet. I can't remember if we have or not. I believe it's been discussed. Because the only advantage that three one might give you, or one, the only advantage I've seen so far for you guys, knowing what you just said about it, that you're not really going to try mm -hmm. to do monitoring with it. The one thing that was in there that I thought was interesting was you can now reboot Windows instances. I don't know though if you're if you're a heavily virtualized environment. I don't know if that really makes a difference. Yeah, and there's other tools that um, we have available to us. I mean, like Control M is something we've been we've been using um, where I work lately, and that's a job based um, tool that can go in and run different scripts for you. And probably rebooting the server, we'd probably throw on like a Control M job and just have somebody from maybe the computer room be able to just run a script that just reboots servers. And basically it's just a script that just says, okay, reboot this, this, and this. Um, probably we wouldn't use Puppet for something like that. We, we have other tools available that we would probably u utilize for that. So like I said, it there's a lot of cool stuff that they're doing with the new version of Puppet. 
all of the stuff. There were several of us that actually sat in on the webinar when they had one, maybe three to four weeks ago, I think we sat in on it. Um, and a lot of us watched it, and when we all got done with it, we were all like, okay, that's awesome. We probably don't need any of those things though, <laughs> which is kind of a which is kind of a bummer because all of the stuff stuff looked really cool, but for what we need it for and what we're utilizing it for, in the other tools and pieces of software we have already established in our environment, this is a duplicate tool in regards to the monitoring piece. So it would basically just be it it wouldn't be something that we could force down anybody to really use. Right. So. So it's all good. It's a great tool. If you haven't used it, try it out. You can get uh, would, as the yeah, article says. Good. You can okay. you can manage ten servers for free. So get it. Try it out. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if they're still doing it. They used to do a VM. You could just download the VM to get the puppet server set up, and then just install the agents. Um. Wherever you on the ten machines you want to try it on. Yeah, and like I said, this is. Puppet's probably one of the coolest tools ever since I became a Linux admin years ago that um, I've run into. I mean, probably definitely one of my top, you know, top couple of utilities. I mean, for being an admin, especially if you you have hundreds of boxes you're taking care of. All right. All right. Let's move on to our next story. Another update's out. Guess what? It's eleven dot. Or, I mean, I'm sorry, 13.10 for Ubuntu. I thought Their I was on the wrong screen for a there. second. I was sorry. like 11. I was like, what story is this? I don't know what's... <laughs> I don't know where I got 11 from. 13.10. 13.10 has probably no features anybody cares about for the desktop. Uh, it's got minor ones. Uh, it's got some next changes. story, then. It's got changes for that. <laughs> and we're done with that. <laughs> All we're right. actually, we are almost done with it. Um, the, the place is... The thing that I was most disappointed with was not doing the Xmere stuff, yeah. which I think we talked about last week. So I won't yeah, I was going to say, yeah, we've talked I about that I won't beat that again. Um, what I thought was cool about it is that the bulk of the changes and the bulk of the time that Canonical spent on 1310 were on the server-side version of Ubuntu and taking the, um, the servers and making them more adaptable for... OpenStack and other cloud implementations so that you could do cloud implementations easier. So if you want to play around with different cloud stuff like OpenStack, I have done the installation on a VM with Ubuntu, and it is super simple to set up. And actually, their tools are coming along quite a bit or quite quickly for being able to stand up servers in that cloud-type space. So if you had a, a default way that you installed um, let's say WebSphere with you know a certain version of MQ series and it needed to be configured this way so that you could add it to a cluster. Uh, the servers are set up to the their cloud stuff is getting really close to being able to just do all that stuff automatically for you. That's so you awesome. Just go. I need another server and and hit it. Um, VMware already has tools to do that. So does uh, Red Hat. But Canonical is picking up speed quickly and they're coming on fast. Um, and that was where the bulk of the changes were for 13.10. So, yeah. When you, can the, get into, when you can get into stuff like that as an admin, it saves you so much time. Because we do all of our we do all of our servers on a Kickstart now, and you pick what type of server you want, be it Slez or Red Hat, and it just bam, it builds it for you. You join it to the Puppet server, it pushes down all your RPMs, done. Right. Yeah. Um, it takes. Thing. It takes. Don't don't undersell the time it takes to get it set up initially. Yes. But the time spent setting it up is well worth the payment coming out of it. So, you you know, I was having this discussion with my project lead and trying to get him to... He's a not a young guy, but he's younger than me. Um, and I tried to explain to him, you know, I sat down and wrote a script to do an inventory of a server and put it into a, a document format that we needed. I spent 20 hours writing that script, but my calculation of what it was going to take me to do the next 100 servers was easily 60 hours. So by spending 20 hours doing this script, or in your guys' case, spending however many hours they've spent fine-tuning and getting everything just right with the Kickstarter scripts and the, the other scripts, it's it's saving you guys all that time, like probably tens. You guys have had it for at least four years, probably way more than that, like, you know, 
the money that you've put into it has definitely paid for itself back. You guys have oh, to definitely. hire additional staff to handle the additional workloads. and it, it, The ROI on that software, that type of software, is always worth it. Whether It doesn't matter what OS you're using. It's always worth it. That's why I'm a huge proponent of DevOps. And that's why that's what I do. That's kind of my specialty. Because I know how much fun it is to do and how much of a benefit it is. But, all right, off that soapbox, and, and we're going to change gears towards network monitoring. We're not really changing that much. But <laughs> we're going to say, this actually follows along with several of the stories we've discussed already tonight. Yeah, I know. I was just trying to make it sound better. But anyways, um... OpsView does surveys on a periodic basis. Looks like they're doing them quarterly, but I don't remember getting asked to do one before this. But anyways, uh, they came back and wanted to know how people were using their monitoring tool. OpsView, for people who aren't familiar with it, is one of those monitoring type solutions Joe was referring to that are usually separate from tools like Puppet, Salt, or anything else that you could use to manage systems. Um, and these guys are, are specifically, or not specifically, but the large amount of focus for most monitoring tools is on networking equipment because it's so hard to manage uh, without a tool. I mean, if you just have to go manage 100 switches in an office building, that's a lot of work. So tools like this, like OpsView and, and others, will help you manage that stuff. So they were asking how many people were actually using the tools that they, tools like the ones they create, just to, to get a feel for it. Um, it was interesting to see more, not what people were doing, but what people were not doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, because some of the numbers, so, like, do you monitor syslog for your devices? Like, 41% of the companies aren't even looking at syslog information, which is where you get most of your errors and positive information, too. You know, this actually reconnected, that, that did it, that looks that way. 41% of the companies not doing it just seemed really high to me, but I'll take them at their word that that's what people responded. Um, that was probably I wonder the if... C. That was probably the C answer, and everybody said C was right, so they just checked it and moved on. I'm, I'm right. wondering how many of the people probably just were like, you know, I don't we're we're monitoring this and this. Yeah, no, we don't do that, but they are actually. I just wonder yeah. how many people possibly filled this out that could be maybe at like a managerial level or, level or something and aren't really, <laughs> aren't really aware. understanding, aren't really aware of what's actually being monitored possibly. I mean, it it's all possible. depends on who was, who answered these questions. You know, who the, that who, day, who that, said over 250 respondents, it's, yeah. it all depends on who the, the, the people were. Well, that was but, the day the CFO got the mail. Yeah. The <laughs> exactly. <out>. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and, and if I was the CFO, if we if we go with your guys' theory, the next one that I thought was disturbing should be even more disturbing. Because 33% of the people said they're not backing up the configurations on their network devices. So Cowboy goes in, changes something, nobody has anything to fall back to. That was just, it blew me away. I was like, really? I thought we stopped doing that years ago. Um, I think the sampling is a little too small and just a little... It is. But still, out of 250, I still wouldn't expect it to be 33%, not backing up. It would be like 1% or 5 or 10%. But I don't know. I've worked with enough companies to know that a lot of it is just you don't have enough manpower and enough hours in the day to get everything that you should be doing done. I, I get it, but, geez, think about the cost. <laughs> Especially if it's the CFO filling out this survey. <laughs> Maybe they went to different Starbucks or something, and you know, no, the guys aren't backing up the, you know, the links, the links, this um, access it's like points. It's like, <laughs> really, it's like a really, are like, we don't know. It's like the really bad shit documentary where some guy goes into some <laughs> random coffee shops, like, you sir, are you backing up your router configs? What? Oh. <sighs> And uh, I, that was it. Well, and are you currently using a monitoring tool? That was the most self-serving question I thought of the whole survey. Are you currently using a monitoring tool? Let's ask if you're actually using something like us so that we can then spam the 18% that would said you, no. Would you like to? Because <laughs> we have one for you. 
That's why just looking at the, if, you're, <laughs> if you're the one taking the survey, that's the one, just if anybody knows, that was the question to figure out whether or not to put you on their spam list. And 18% of the respondents said, yes, please spam me, because I'm telling you I don't actually use that. There were some other things that were absolutely no surprise, like uh, who's the favorite network vendor? It was Cisco by a, three times the next one. I didn't even remember that HP was still making networking equipment. But I guess sure. I didn't either. I knew Dell did Brocade, uh, Juniper. But anyways, it was an interesting survey of results. It was it was pretty cool. There's really no sales. I don't see any sales pitches in it to speak of. We'll have a link in the uh, in the show notes so everybody can can check it out and see the rest of the stuff we didn't cover in there. Um, if you're looking for tools to try out, definitely try out Ops View. It's it's pretty good. Uh, there are other tools like Xenos, which are just as good, and you should probably try. If you're going to go for something open source based, I would try a few of them, not just one. So I would try yeah. Ops View. I would try Xenos, and I would try. Personally, Groundworks Open Source is the other one, um, and there's another new one which I'll put in the show notes that I'm totally blanking on right now. That there's a new Upstart one that is uh, it looks better. It's a little cleaner. The thing, the funny thing is, is most of the out open source ones are built on top of the granddaddy of all monitoring in the open source world, which is Nagios. Um, Xenos has rewritten large parts of it, so it doesn't really look like Nagios on the inside anymore. But most of them are using the good old Nagios package, if you're familiar mm -hmm. with it. But it's not your father's Nagios. It's much easier to implement than than Nagios used to be. Although I missed the days. You guys probably never saw it, but there was a tool called Big Brother, which you would set up, and it was just brain-dead simple to set up to monitor all this stuff. It didn't use Nagios, but it, it would do pings. You could do SNMP grabs and all this other stuff. I've, seen all, I've a, seen all the Nagios stuff at one of my other jobs. But this was one Big the, Brother. This was totally different. This wasn't Nagios. This was another yeah. another open-source tool. And it disappeared. I went looking for it the other day because I was like, I just want something simple that will tell me what's up. And I don't want to have to implement a whole monitoring suite, but it looks like I'm going to have to. Yeah, the one network guy where I used to work, he had all the Nagios monitoring set up on every piece of network equipment. It was crazy. Yes. And guess what? We managed to get through all the stories, and it wasn't even a two-hour podcast. Even yeah, and with Brian, didn't, Brian didn't drop on, off again. And I didn't drop off a second time. Um, there was one general story that we were going we to mention, I guess, that was out there. Um, in case you all are familiar with using ISOHunt to search for your favorite MPAA-related materials, uh, the MPAA was successfully able to shut them down hmm. in their lawsuit. So they will be gone as of the end of the week, I believe. So if you're, if you're going to go there, better off looking for Pirate Bay because they'll probably have it. Well, they probably had a better list anyways. But ISOHunt is officially going in the way of the dodo. I remember using that, man. That's why I put yeah, it back in the day. It's like, no, I so hunt. That's where I downloaded yeah, all was, my shit Windows copies from. That was one of the. <laughs> that was one of the sites back in the day. I couldn't even tell you the last time I went out there. All right. I yeah. loved. I loved when you went to those. And it was like download Windows 2K, and then you, it doesn't specify the language, and you get it, and it's like the JP version. <laughs> so, <laughs> bitch. Yes, yes, yes. Anyways. Anybody have any other stories? No. Nope. All right. In conclusion, the of the week. you can follow us on Twitter and pump.io as at linuxinstall.net. We're also, we have a Google Plus community. You can go check out our website. You can follow us on Facebook. We're Linux Install on Facebook. Or Linux Install.net, I'm sorry, on Facebook. And what should everybody go do, Greg? Um... Install Linux and play with uh, Placenta Chicken. Okay. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs> Cat socks. <Yeah>. Cat socks. <laughs> and that does it. See ya. Have a nice week. See, See ya. ya.